Uh, so good day, everyone, and thank you to Lymphoma Action for inviting me to talk to you. My name is Dr. Adam Gibb. I'm a specialty doctor in lymphoma at the Christie Hospital in Manchester, and I have been practicing in the field for approximately 12 years now. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you about the high-grade lymphomas in 2021. A brief overview of the talk, uh, we're going to speak about the two most common aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphomas, the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and the various T-cell lymphomas. As just a little bit of background, first of all, uh, the chart you see on the screen in front of you is the family tree of normal blood cells as they're born in the bone marrow with a progenitor cell up at the top, and then they divide and mature and turn into all the various different types of healthy blood cell which circulate around uh, the uh, blood system. When these cells over here in the purple box go wrong and turn cancerous, we give these tumors, these cancers, the name lymphoma. They are cancers of white blood cells named lymphocytes. Every couple of years, the World Health Organization classifies these diseases in a book which gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And this slide here, um, you'll need your glasses to squint at it, is a list of at least 70 different lymphomas. That just illustrates the breadth of the problem that we have to deal with. And this list includes B-cell diseases, T-cell diseases, low-grade lymphomas and high-grade lymphomas. It's worth just defining what we mean by grade. Grade is a pretty common term bandied about in the clinic. Um, it's been in use for many decades now. But to be really strict, this is a very formal histopathological term. So this is used by the doctors in the laboratory who are looking at the tumour under the microscope. And it sort of describes the appearance that these are large, uh, aggressive cells undergoing very frequent replication. And that does tend to correlate with the clinical behaviour of the lymphoma that we see in the patient in the clinic. Perhaps a more modern term would be aggressive. This is doing what it says on the tin, so a clinical term used day to day by oncologists and describing rapidly growing tumours with unpleasant symptoms. And these tumours require treatment um, on a semi-urgent basis in order to preserve life and health. After a diagnosis of lymphoma, many people, of course, ask what has caused this. And most cases are simply random chance, bad luck, out of the blue, nasty things happening to nice people. Or in the technical lingo, they are idiopathic and sporadic, which is simply fancy medical terms for we don't know why. Um, a handful of cases will be caused by obvious nasties like radiation, horrible chemicals, um, there are some uh, genetic links, but we don't really uh, understand them very well. And as a general rule, the lymphomas are not hereditary. And occasionally um, common uh, infections, things like the Epstein-Barr virus or the H. pylori bacteria will trigger a lymphoma. Overall, lymphoma is the fifth commonest cancer and forms around 4% of all cancers most lymphomas are derived from B cells and some from T cells. And with regards to non-Hodgkin lymphoma itself, we get around 12,000 cases per year in the UK and a diagnosis is at an average age of 55 years. So here is a nice little uh, cartoon of the so-called lymphoreticular system, those little chains of lymph nodes and other associated organs like the liver, spleen and thymus and also your tonsils. So lymphomas commonly arise within this system, but we do need to remember that lymphomas can actually grow anywhere in the body. Uh, and actually up to 40% of the non-Hodgkin lymphomas uh, will present with a growth outside of the nodal system, so-called extranodal in the lingo, sometimes involving the bone marrow and rarely involving the central nervous system. So what do we see in our patients when they come to us? Um, 
they typically have symptoms from the lumps themselves. So a cough or chest pain. If you've got lumps in the chest, you might be short of breath. If you've got lumps in your tummy, you might have abdominal pain or dysfunction of your bowel. Lymphomas are cancers of immune cells, so they will secrete immune hormones. These are called the cytokines, and these may drive some of the classic lymphoma symptoms like night sweats, fevers and weight loss, uh, and can also cause people to be fatigued, they'll be short of red cells, we call that anemia, of course, get regular infections, and in some lymphomas cause people to itch. So when people come to us with these symptoms, how do we make the diagnosis? Well, first of all, once they've told us this history, we have to suspect that they have a cancer. We want to examine our patients to find that lump. Once we've found the lump of cancer, we want to get a good biopsy of that lump. Can we get a chunk of that lump out of the person into the laboratory so that our histopathology colleagues can make the diagnosis. And then we will stage the cancer, put the patient through the scanner, asking the question, are there lumps of lymphoma elsewhere? And of course, with lymphomas, frequently the answer there is yes. So in terms of histopathology, the better and bigger the biopsy, um, the easier the histopathologist uh, will, will uh, be able to tell you an accurate diagnosis. As we saw previously, there are over 70 types of lymphoma. It can be hard to tease uh, them apart. And the doctors in the laboratory will be looking at the shape of the cells down the microscope, the morphology, and then we'll apply a whole series of so-called special stains, immunohistochemistry, marking for selected markers, People might be familiar with things like CD20 and CD30. We'll come back to these later in the talk. And increasingly in the modern era, we're doing lots of fancy DNA and RNA. We then want to stage patients, put them through a scanner, either a CT scanner or a PET scanner, perhaps some other tests like a lumbar puncture and a bone marrow, describing the extent of the lymphoma. Where is it? And importantly, of course, where is it not? Here is a, an illustration of what a patient looks like once they've been through the PET scanner. So on the left-hand side of your screen, there's somebody with aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Fundamentally, every dark gray to black dot is a little lump of lymphoma. On the right-hand side, we've got a different patient. This patient has a big lump in the middle of their chest that I can illustrate with the uh, mouse pointer here. This contains the heart which is sort of the nicely heart-shaped uh, object in yellow, and these little yellow dots surrounding it, small flecks of lymphoma in the chest. So once we've put from somebody through the scanner and we've got a stage, we sort of encode this into one, two, three, and four, E, X, A, and B, which is a shorthand for sort of um, describing what your scan looks like. This all got very, very complicated. So in the modern era, we decided that we would simplify it. And nowadays you'll hear doctors talk about limited stage lymphoma, so old school stages one and two, or advanced stage lymphoma, uh, stages three and four. So moving on from some lymphoma basic to sort of set the scene then to talk about the commonest lymphoma in the UK and indeed the commonest aggressive lymphoma, the entity that we all abbreviate to DLBCL or diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So over the years, survival with non-Hodgkin lymphoma has improved. Back in the 70s, only around 20% of people would survive uh, long term with non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Nowadays, we've got long term survival to over 60%. And if we look at the death rate from lymphoma, this was increasing from the 70s through to the 90s. And then in the late 90s, it took a turn. And ever since then, the death rate from lymphoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, has been falling quite rapidly. And the reason here is the introduction of the drug rituximab, which many people in the audience I'm sure will be familiar with. So this really was an absolute game changer in the treatment of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So it was really one of the first drugs in cancer care, which was not a classic chemotherapy. Instead, it was an antibody treatment cooked up in the laboratory 
rather than targeting bugs, which our natural antibodies do, this targets lymphoma and specifically this CD20 molecule on the surface of a lymphoma cell. And when it locks on, it flags that cell for immune destruction. So when you add rituximab to chemotherapy, it just improves the outcome across the board by about 15 to 20%. And there were a couple of major studies uh, performed in the 1990s, which demonstrated this. So what we're seeing here on the screen is the commonest type of graph which cancer doctors show each other. It's called a survival curve. And on the left here, we have some chemotherapy only trials from the 1980s and 1990s. So at the start of the trial, 100% of people are still alive. Every time the curve goes downwards, someone has relapsed and across the bottom here is time in years. And what we can see on this chart over on the left is that if you put various different types of chemotherapy, CHOP, BACOD, PROMACE and MACOP against each other, they all do the same and the curves overlap. So these chemotherapies are the same as each other. No one is better than another. If we then move into the 1990s on the right, we've got rituximab CHOP versus CHOP alone in a randomized trial. And what we can clearly see is that the addition of rituximab produces fewer relapses, the top light blue curve, than CHOP alone, which is the bottom dark blue curve. So our CHOP becomes the standard of care for diffuse large B cell lymphoma at the turn of the century. What we know, however, is that not everybody performs equally well with our CHOP, as well as staging patients, we can attribute them a so-called risk score according to how old they are, what their stage is, what their blood tests are doing, uh, and whether or not they're feeling under the weather with their lymphoma. And as we can see, if you have low risk disease, the blue or yellow curves up here, 80 and 90% of people will do very well with our CHOP. But if you have high risk disease, uh, the gray and brown curves down here, then up to 50% of people will sadly experience a relapse after their R CHOP therapy. So it's for this reason doctors have been trying to look into why this is. And there are lots of complicated uh, theories as to why some people may do well with our CHOP and others do less well to do with some of the, the cells from which the lymphoma derives, um, coded ABC and GCB. Some of the genes involved in the way that the lymphoma behaves, coded MYC and BCL. And just here is a, a slide from a, a medical journal showing some very, very fancy genetic work, being able to divide cases uh, between uh, red and green or ABC and GCB. And the curves on the bottom show that if you have GCB disease, you will have fewer relapses with RCHOP than if you have the red ABC disease. And some similar work has been performed with those MYC and uh, BCL genes. So it's <clears throat> apparent that RCHOP is a good treatment for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It works pretty well for most people, but there are some people that we would very much like to be able to offer them better. So as the years have passed since the turn of the decade, we've had a couple of smart thoughts about how you could improve upon our CHOP. Could you give more chemotherapy? Could you do a so-called stem cell transplant after the R CHOP? Could you give your chemotherapy in a smarter way? Um, or could you bring in new drugs into the mix? We'll br very briefly cover some of these. So the French have designed um, a variation upon our CHOP called ACVBP, which is long and complicated. It involves admitting you to hospital um, over a period of up to 19 weeks and delivering intensive chemotherapy by prolonged infusion. And in a randomized trial, they claim it's superior to CHOP, but there are a couple of problems here. Um, they won't sell you uh, the drug V, um, and as it discussed, it takes 19 weeks to deliver in hospital, something that's not really feasible, uh, we feel, for the majority, particularly of older UK patients. So this is something which has never really taken off internationally, but the French would 
lay claim that this is a better trimmer than CHOP. There's been lots and lots of little trials over the years about whether or not a stem cell transplant in your first remission after our CHOP can reduce your risk of relapsing, e.g. increase your chance of cure. And to summarize, if you pour all of the results into a blender and mix them up, so that's what this fancy chart here is doing. At the bottom, you get a result which says even Stevens, it is neither better nor worse to have a stem cell transplant in your first remission. It just doesn't make any difference. The Americans came along and said, we like all the drugs in CHOP. We like another drug called etoposide. And rather than drip them through in a couple of hours over an afternoon, we're actually going to drip them through very, very slowly over 96 hours continuously. And they renamed our chop Da Epoch R. And this early trials were very, very impressive with up to 100 percent of people responding to this smeared out chop chemotherapy. But then they came along and did a big randomized trial and followed people up for five years afterwards. And what we saw in the red box here is that there was no difference in survival after five years, around 70 percent of younger patients and 60, 65 percent of older patients were still alive five years later with no difference between the two groups. The Brits had some very clever ideas about designing a trial based around those fancy red and green genes that I showed you, throwing some new drugs into the R-CHOP mix. Once again, we have one of these plots showing that typically it doesn't really make much difference, no better, no worse. And then Roche, the people who designed rituximab, recognized their patent was running out. The drug was now 20 years old, so they thought they'd better make a new uh, antibody codenamed G. So they did a G-CHOP versus R-CHOP trial, and again, sure, no difference in survival at three years. Effectively, this was even Stevens down the line. So sadly, what we know is that up to 40% of patients will relapse after R-CHOP, and basically, the last two decades of trials, trials and trials has really not moved the needle. We have not been able to improve upon our CHOP. It's a better treatment than CHOP alone was in the 80s and 90s, but there are still some people for whom it's not good <coughs> enough. So these people undergo second line chemotherapy, and if that's successful, we give them a stem cell transplant. So this was a trial from the 1980s, demonstrating if you take relapses, give them chemotherapy and transplant them, they'll do reasonably well with around half of people surviving. If you don't transplant patients and give them chemotherapy alone, this bottom curve, sadly, most people will relapse again. We repeated this trial in the modern age of rituximab and we did not get as good results. We've got this red box down here in the bottom left, showing that if you relapse after R-CHOP, it's quite hard to get you back into a long-term remission with more chemotherapy and a stem cell transplant. So this is really uh, where the second half of the talk comes in. <clears throat> what are all the new sort of ideas in how do you tackle uh, aggressive, relapsed, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma? So knocking around NHS funded for around two, just over two years now, is the fantastically named CAR-T, or Chimeric Antigen Receptor T-cell Therapy, uh, to give it its full name. So what we do here is very cleverly build a genetically engineered T-cell. So these are T-cells taken from the patient's bloodstream and engineered in the laboratory uh, by uh, infusing them with a specially coded virus um, to basically recognize and attack lymphoma cells. <clears throat> so this is the, the, the process in the cartoon that you see here, making these special recognizing T cells, and then we reinfuse them back into patients and those cells will then circulate around the body, recognize lymphoma cells wherever they may reside uh, and attack them. <clears throat> 
when they lock on to the lymphoma cell through this car, they will then um, secrete a whole load of sort of killing molecules, which will dissolve uh, the lymphoma cell in a very impressive fashion. Again, when we did one of these clinical trials and plotted um, the survival curves, what we could see here in the green and blue lines is that those people who had a response, that's the blue line, or even better, a complete response, uh, the green line to CAR T therapy tended to have quite a long response. And sadly, of course, those people who didn't have a good response overall uh, underwent an early relapse. CAR T is generally safe. Uh, some places in America are delivering this in the outpatients, but there are some serious side effects in up to around a third of patients, including infections and some rare complications called cytokine release and neurological events. Patients will not infrequently have to go to intensive care to be looked after um, for these complications. So what are some of the newer drugs, sort of off-the-shelf pharmacological agents available in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma? Big news in Hodgkin lymphoma around one decade ago uh, was a, a very new drug called an antibody drug, conjugate, something that comes in two parts uh, named Brentuximab vedotin. Um, this was very successful in Hodgkin, so naturally we have tried it in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, um, but actually it just didn't work very well. A variation upon Brentuximab vedotin, Polituximab vedotin, has been successfully, however, through phase two and three trials and now has a, a fast track license uh, from 2019. And a similar drug uh, called ADCT402 is moving rapidly through its trials. So here's a little cartoon of how these antibody drug conjugates work. So we have these large Y shaped antibody molecules. These will recognize unique markers on the lymphoma surface, and they carry with them these little um, here uh, yellow hexagons, which are ultra potent cell toxins. So they lock on to your lymphoma cell. They're taken inside by the cell, whereby the toxin is digested or freed from the antibody conjugate, and it can go on to poison the cell nucleus in a very potent fashion. So fundamentally, these are a bit like guided missiles. We're delivering ultra potent chemotherapy drugs directly inside our lymphoma cells of choice. Here is a patient at the Christie who was on a clinical trial of ADCT402. He had undergone no fewer than five relapses of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. We can see on the left his PET scan uh, highlighting active lymphoma in the chest, abdomen uh, and groin and two doses of ADCT402 later he had gone into complete remission. The only activity we can see on the right is a uh, normal um, physiological activity. In a clinical trial where people receive varying different doses of this drug uh, we could see that around a third of patients uh, had growth of the tumour but the majority of patients in the trial had shrinkage of the tumour and overall around one quarter of them went into a, a complete remission uh, and that was an early phase or phase one trial so we're looking forward to updated results from phase two in the near future. Uh, I'll briefly mention Selanexor. This is a tablet which has been licensed in the US in the last year. Um, I have to say that the trial in my opinion, was a little underwhelming. They only saw 29% of patients respond to the tablet. Only 13% of them had a complete response. Nevertheless, the manufacturer has persuaded the Federal Drug Administration this is worthwhile, and patients in America, although not currently in the UK, uh, can receive this drug if their diffuse large B cell relapses. Of more interest to UK patients is polituzumab vedotin, another one of these antibody drug conjugates targeting Y-shaped antibody, ultra potent toxin bound to the core of it to be freed inside your cell of choice. Uh, interestingly here, we did a randomized trial of chemotherapy versus polituzumab. Um, and what we could see is that there is a survival um, and relapse advantage to receiving polituzumab um, versus chemotherapy in relapse.
very briefly at the end of the talk, I'll just touch upon a very uh, exciting uh, new field of drugs currently undergoing phase one trials. These are the so-called T-cell bispecifics. So we've looked at these Y-shaped molecules such as rituximab, um, and the antibody drug conjugates previously. Uh, and typically with an antibody, the two different tips of the Y will both bind the same target. It just grabs on twice as it were. With these bispecifics, we've modified the antibody so that the two different heads, they grab a different target each. So one head will grab uh, a T cell in the immune system. Another head will grab uh, the B cell of the diffuse large B cell tumor, bang these heads together, make the T cell recognize the B cell and secrete all of these killing enzymes. There's a couple of drugs in development at the moment, but perhaps epcaritimab and mosenetuzumab are uh, the furthest ahead. And they've had some uh, recent and very encouraging uh, data uh, suggesting that uh, in the region of half of patients, with relapsed diffuse large B cell lymphoma may respond to these drugs and the side effect profiles are looking very favorable indeed. These are easy to deliver drugs in the outpatient department. So these are rarer than the B cell lymphomas, forming only around 10% of aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma in the Western world, but up to around 25% in Asia. <clears throat> T-cell lymphoma, again, is just a heading. It actually, that, there's actually multiple subtypes uh, listed here in this pie chart. The commonest subtypes are peripheral T-cell and angioimmunoblastic, the, the dark blue and yellow slices, respectively. Ordinarily, we treat these patients with CHOP, and what we see is the results are not quite as good as they are in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma unless you have a particularly rare subtype called ALCL with ALK positivity, in which case you'll sit up here on this green line. Um, but this is typically a rare condition of younger adults. It doesn't reflect most people with T-cell lymphoma. And again, we can apply these prognostic indices and see the higher risk disease you have, then really the survival in T-cell lymphoma is, is not as good as in B-cell lymphoma. A couple of thoughts that people have had. Um, if you give a stem cell transplant in first remission after CHOP chemotherapy, you do get a more rosy looking curve. This is some data from the Nordic group on the right hand side here. Uh, but these numbers are relatively small and this trial wasn't randomized. So it may well be that the people in the non-transplant curve on the left and the transplant curve on the right, they might not be the same type of patient. It might not be possible to make direct comparisons between these two approaches. Uh, the Germans uh, did a clinical trial that was randomized of giving a CHOP-like chemotherapy, CHOEP, the upper black curve, versus a high dose chemotherapy, the delightfully named mega CHOEP. And somewhat uh, perversely, they found that high dose chemotherapy was worse than standard dose chemotherapy in T cell lymphoma. So they didn't push the field on there. Very interestingly, if you have that rare ALCL that relapses and you have the new Hodgkin drug, Hodgkin drug Brentuximab for dotin, almost everybody responds in relapse. So we took this forward into a randomized trial of mixing Brentuximab-Bedotin and CHOP chemotherapy together and then randomizing people between the new mixture and old school CHOP. And what we saw is that the new recipe, including Brentuximab-Bedotin, produced superior survival. So the blue curve on the top rather than old school uh, purple CHOP on the bottom and on average, uh, it extended people's remissions by over a factor of two, an average 48 months of remission uh, with Brentuximab CHOP rather than 21 months with CHOP alone. And this has now very recently uh, been NICE approved and NHS uh, funded for UK patients. Uh, and not only does uh, that combination improve uh, what we call progression-free or relapse-free survival, it even improves overall survival. So we're having fewer people die with newer treatment. We've been asked a question uh, 
of how fast is a fast-growing lymphoma and how quickly would we expect to get sim for symptoms to get worse. This does vary from patient to patient um, and also from high-grade lymphoma to high-grade lymphoma. So for example, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma typically grows more rapidly than Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, a very rare condition not discussed here called Burkitt lymphoma would grow more rapidly uh, again. Typically, the way that doctors think about it is <clears throat> how, how are things changing for the patient? If things are changing on a week by week basis, we probably need to get a move on and start trimming in the next week or two. If things are changing on a month by month basis, that might give you the luxury of a little bit more time. Perhaps we could get a couple more tests in. Perhaps we might be able to think about a, a clinical trial before we start treatment. One of the things which doctors assess is the so-called performance score or performance data summarized briefly as what can you do for yourself? What do you need help doing with? And basically those patients who are still able to look after themselves should still have a good outcome with chemotherapy. They're not yet too poorly um, that they've compromised their chances. Uh, so we've been asked a question uh, about uh, whether high-grade lymphoma is curable and what the difference between a cure and a remission might be. So, of course, we, we discussed the fact there were 70 different types of lymphoma, uh, various different types of high-grade lymphoma. Um, most cases of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma are potentially curable. Um, and some cases of T-cell lymphoma are potentially curable. It will vary according to specifically what type of diffuse large B or T-cell lymphoma you have, how fit the patient is, and how much treatment they're able to tolerate. Typically, when doctors prescribe our CHOP for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, we are aiming to cure. Other situations need to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. The question about the difference between remission and cure. <clears throat> remission is a state whereby the lymphoma has shrunk under the influence of treatment and that the symptoms of the lymphoma have been improved or perhaps wholly abolished. And of course, the patient might be telling you that during chemotherapy as their lumps shrink and they feel better. And then the PET scan at the end of chemotherapy might confirm remission. In a condition which is potentially curable, um, the patient will be followed up. And of course, the longer that they stay in remission as time passes, their risk of relapse is falling. Most patients who have not relapsed for a two year period after the attainment of remission in say diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, those patients have a very, very low subsequent risk of relapse and therefore they could consider themselves cured with some of the rarer T-cell lymphomas, or of course, low-grade lymphomas, where relapses are more likely, um, then a remission might not be the same thing as a cure, and that would require a discussion with your cancer doctor. Um, so some questions about scans, um, and what type of scans we use. Well, there's two very common types that we do use. The CT scan, which looks at structure or anatomy, and is typically uh, presented on the screen in black, white and shades of grey. And then the PET scan, which shows you uptake and metabolism, tumour activity, and is typically shown in multicolour. In the aggressive lymphomas, PET scans are more useful, they're more meaningful than CT scans. Uh, and most doctors will do a PET scan before chemotherapy and another PET scan after chemotherapy. And it's those pre and post scans which we understand the implications of uh, with most clarity. We can sort of talk to people with meaning. Occasionally, we do scans at the halfway point through chemotherapy. Uh, we understand what that means in Hodgkin lymphoma very, very well. The meaning of a so-called interim scan in non-Hodgkin lymphoma it is still unclear, uh, in my opinion, uh, and certainly at the Christie, it's not routine practice to do an interim PET scan, uh, say, during our chop chemotherapy. 
Some people uh, ask why we wouldn't do scans in follow-up. That's a very interesting question. And we've actually looked at this in clinical trials. So if you did a scan every three months over the next two years after our CHOP, uh, let's say, asking the question, could the scanner detect the relapse before the patient became symptomatic and told their doctors or nurses that they were feeling less well? And interestingly, the answer is no. The scan will not detect the relapse before the patient tells the doctor anyway. And it's on that scientific basis that we don't routinely scan people after they've achieved a remission. Uh, so we've had a, a question about different treatment options. Um, so first of all, surgery. So surgery is extremely useful in the diagnosis of lymphoma. And it might also be useful if the lymphoma has caused an emergency by blocking one of the hollow organs or hollow tubes in the body. That's a very serious situation. You might need to relieve that tube very, very promptly. So the surgeons are extremely helpful in that regard. What surgery doesn't do is treat lymphoma overall, all around the body. And of course, most lymphomas are widespread conditions involving multiple areas. So it's for that reason that in the main, surgery is not a treatment of lymphoma overall. Other treatments for lymphoma can, of course, include radiotherapy, an extremely useful uh, treatment. Um, integrating chemotherapy and radiotherapy together can be a very powerful uh, tool indeed. And touched upon, of course, uh, in the talk have been some of the newer treatments for lymphoma, CAR-T, bispecifics, antibody drug conjugates, and of course, in initial relapse, high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell transplantation remains uh, the mainstay of treating resistant lymphoma. So we've had a question about whether lymphomas can relapse uh, as a different subtype. Um, and is it possible to have more than one lymphoma at the, at the present time? Uh, the brief answer is yes and yes. Um, people with low grade lymphoma may have been warned about the prospect of transformation. So experiencing a future relapse with the high grade cousin of their current low grade disease. It's possible, of course, that some people diagnosed with high grade lymphoma have fundamentally presented with transformation and that lurking amongst their high grade lymphoma is a previously undiagnosed low grade lymphoma. Those patients, of course, could in future relapse with either high grade or low grade. And then it's entirely possible to be diagnosed with completely separate lymphomas, either at the same time um, or at different times in your, your life. Um, you're not immunized against uh, any one type of lymphoma by previously being diagnosed with another. Life, I'm afraid, is just not like that. Uh, so questions about late effects, I think, are very important and very interesting. So, you know, really what I'd like to be the takeaway message from this talk is actually that most patients with high grade lymphoma, can expect either to be cured or at the very least experience substantial multi-year remissions. And this, of course, means that people will be alive in the future to potentially experience the so-called late effects of therapy uh, arising 5, 10, 15 years down the line. These are uh, many and varied, essentially pick a tissue or organ and we could have a late effect in that system. Some of the big ones are heart disease. So heart health is extremely important in lymphoma survivors and a particular interest of uh, the research term team here at the Christie and elsewhere around the UK. And fertility, of course, is extremely important for our younger patients who have yet to complete their families. Um, any patient who has the ability to wait a couple of weeks, perhaps two weeks before they start their chemotherapy, could undergo fertility preservation, something which is, of course, a little easier for gentlemen than it is for ladies. Uh, so follow up is a area of great interest um, and most institutions would follow people up fairly regularly for about two years after treatment and, that's, and then less regularly following that. And what that really reflects is the science that we touched upon in an earlier answer. 
in the diseases that are going to relapse, they're typically going to relapse in the first two years after diagnosis. Once you've made it two years past diagnosis, the risk of relapse beyond that point becomes rather low. When relapses do occur, typically we get a replay of the original symptoms. Uh, people are it's experiencing them all over again. They're now very aware of this. Of course, they're in touch with their lymphoma teams and they will typically report their symptoms to their teams in between scheduled visits. So perhaps the single most important thing about relapse, if you cut through all the various differences in how frequently do I go to the clinic? Have I had a blood test? Have I had a scan, et cetera, et cetera. If patients don't feel well and they're not getting better after a week or so, e.g. this is not the flu, then they should contact their lymphoma teams, um, chat through their symptoms, and if necessary, pop into the clinic on an ad hoc basis so that they can get checked over. I think that is the single most important fact about follow-up. So of course, it was Sir Isaac Newton who said, uh, if I have seen further, it is because I stand on the shoulders of giants. So everything that I do in the routine treatment clinic was a treatment which came off the back of a clinical trial. So we give our chop because we did the R chop versus chop trials in the 1990s. We gave chop because we did the CHOP versus other chemotherapy trials in the 1980s. The various different drugs that compose CHOP uh, came from the trials, of course, in the 50s, 60s and 70s. So trials are absolutely critical to moving the field forwards. So uh, different trials are being run at different times in different hospitals. Um, so, you know, not every hospital can offer every trial. But it's always useful if you've been told that you have lymphoma or perhaps you know you have lymphoma and you've been told you've, you're having a relapse and you need to contemplate more treatment. You should, of course, be offered the standard treatment that's been approved and sits on the shelf, as it were, in the pharmacy. Um, but you just feel free to inquire. Are there any clinical trials here? And if not at this hospital, is there a clinical trial in a hospital up the road? There are websites, uh, one of them called clinicaltrials.gov, that are accessible by patients and doctors alike, exactly the same website. Uh, you can search, um, and I'm aware that Lymphoma Action uh, hosts a, a very comprehensive uh, uh, trial list on their website too. Um, here at the Christie, we run uh, approximately 30 uh, recruiting lymphoma trials at any one type, and are happy to accept patients from all over the UK, and I'm sure the same thing goes for the major trial centres um, scattered around the country as well. Uh, so I suppose the take home message with trials is don't be shy, just ask.